and welcome to attendees from around the world uh, to the launch of the Global Panel's new brief on harnessing aquaculture for healthy diets. I'm really delighted that you're able to join us. And I'd also like to express my thanks at the outset to World Fish for being co-host uh, to this meeting. We're very excited to be working with them today. And uh, I can see that a lot of people are joining the meeting. Um, we're going to do a couple of polls during the meeting. So we'll have some insight into where people are coming from. At the moment, we've nearly got 100 people joining us. And let's hope that number uh, goes up. So while um, uh, we're just waiting for a few more people to join us, I can see we've gone over 100 now. Uh, I'd just like to introduce myself. So I'm Sandy Thomas. I'm director of the Global Panel on Agriculture and Food Systems for Nutrition and I'll be moderating the meeting today. So there should be some housekeeping rules that are coming up on the screen uh, very shortly, and that will give you uh, some uh, guidance as to how we're going to run uh, the event. I'm not going to go through them, um, but as you're going to hear from our speakers, both aquaculture and fisheries are a hugely important part of global efforts um, to better transform food systems so they can provide not just a sustainable planet, but healthy diets for all. And there are a lot of opportunities um, that we can take on in the next few years uh, that we're going to be hearing about today. So we've got some experts uh, here, two experts who are going to run through the brief um, and set out its main uh, uh, evidence and also the recommendations. And we've also got a panel uh, of three experts in the field who are going to provide their perspectives on what the opportunities are. And, and we can also learn from, from uh, their experience. So um, we've now gone up to, yeah, we're over 100 now. Um, and uh, we're going to have two uh, people, uh, Sir John Beddington, uh, who's chair of the global panel, and also uh, Dr. Gareth Johnson, uh, who's um, director to General of World Fish, who are going to set the scene for us. And we're really delighted that uh, World Fish has had a, a new strategy, which really is uh, makes the timing of, of our, our um, different pieces of work really, really very, uh, very uh, fruitful, I think. So I'm going to, um, without further ado, um, ask um, um, uh, Dr. Johnson to provide some opening remarks. Thanks, uh, thanks, Sandy, and thanks for everyone who's joined and made time today to join us <coughs> to learn about the GLOPAN policy brief on harnessing aquaculture for healthy diets, and also to discuss about the set of concrete evidence-based, uh, evidence-based, uh, excuse me, evidence-based recommendations that policymakers can take on board in order to leave the world's fastest growing food production sector to meet critical SDGs by 2030. But first, let me start by thanking our wonderful co-hosts of the Global Panel for Agriculture and Food Systems for Nutrition. Sir John, who will come on shortly, and Sandy, thanks very much for moderating, and the GLOPAN team for reaching out to Wellfish and for offering us the opportunity to work together on such a timely piece of work. The brief outlines the role and contributions of aquaculture specifically and that of aquatic food systems more broadly in responding to the global call to action for a food systems transformation towards healthier and sustainable diets. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with Well Fish, we are a global nonprofit research and innovation organization that creates advances and translate scientific research on aquatic food systems into scalable solutions with transformational impact on human well-being and the environment. We are part of 1CGIR, the world's largest agricultural innovation network whose mission is to end hunger by 2030 through science to transform food, land and water systems under threat of climate change. <clears throat> now within 1CGIR and the wider global agricultural research agenda, we have a unique research mandate that focuses on the role and contributions of aquatic food systems to the 2030 SDGs. And we believe that sustainable aquaculture as an important component of aquatic food systems is critical to meeting shared national and global aspirations for establishing healthy, nutritious, sustainable inclusive food systems capable of achieving the SDGs by 2030. And the world faces the enormous challenge of feeding 9.8 billion people by, uh, by 2050, providing 
Affordable, safe, nutritious food for all has become an increasing challenge due to the scale of the demand and increasing threat of climate change. And this task is made more urgent by the current food and nutrition crisis and the adverse social and economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, which will set us back in terms of the progress we are already making towards the 2030 SDGs. And these set setbacks weigh heavier on the people living in low and middle income countries as COVID-19 pushes more people into poverty, hunger and malnutrition. Now, aquaculture uh, is the fastest growing food producing sector. Fish and aquatic foods are one of the most traded food commodities globally. The value of aquatic food production through aquaculture alone in 2018 was $264 billion. Aquatic foods offer a viable, nutritious and sustainable alternative that is traditionally overlooked in the global agriculture research agenda, which supports the sustainable development at country levels. Already, about 3.3 billion people worldwide attain about 20% of their average per capita intake of animal protein from fish and aquatic foods. Now, aquatic foods are rich in, in numerous vitamins, minerals, omega-3, fatty acids, and other nutrients essential for cognitive development and human health. They could also offer a very critical solution for the 2 billion people worldwide who suffer the triple burden of malnutrition, with women and children poised to benefit the most. Now, compared to other animal source food, many aquatic foods offer multiple nutritional benefits at a lower environmental cost than most land-based animal production systems. They're also big business, and the kind of business that does not always favor those who are the most dependent on aquatic food systems for food, nutrition, incomes, and well-being. So we know these facts, so I hope when you read the, 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 the brief, you will know these facts even more. And we also know that research alone cannot provide people with more and better food, improve environmental sustainability, or reduce climate risk. We need to situate scientific research within an innovation ecosystem of partners, stakeholders, networks, assets, and institutions to turn research into demand-driven products, services, and policy solutions at scale. <laughs> multi-sector coordination and interdisciplinary uh, collaboration as a GLOPAN brief indicates is absolutely key here. Transformative change requires us to adopt a holistic food systems approach for careful consideration of the options and trade-offs between competing food production systems in land and water. The need to prioritize nutrition and social economic inclusion of women, children, and other vulnerable groups, and the need for integrated solutions with multiple complementary policy wins that enable positive food system outcomes for environmental sustainability and resilience, inclusive growth, and improved nutrition and public health. And this is paramount to accelerate the speed of innovation and transformation of food, land, and water systems. And in a way, the COVID-19 pandemic is forcing us to reimagine new ways of doing things and of working together with a renewed focus on food systems research approaches that are interdisciplinary and holistic. We have an opportunity to rethink the future of food, where it comes from, how it's produced, distributed and consumed and who benefits from it and how it impacts our environment. There has been historical underinvestment in aquatic foods research and innovation because traditionally the agricultural research agenda has been largely focused on land crops and livestock. The deepening scarcity of land and widespread degradation of resources and ecosystem functions are placing a number of key food production systems around the globe at risk, posing a, a profound challenge to the task of feeding a growing world population. It's food from below water that will feed the future and sustainable aquaculture alongside sustainable management of fisheries will have a major role to play here. The Green Revolution, which focused primarily on land crops and livestock has led to improved food security, nutrition and livelihoods for billions of people over the past 70 years. However, with the emphasis on increased crop productivity, its benefits are marked by geographical disparities as well as significant health and environmental costs. The next great transformation must involve a transition towards food, land or water systems that are equitable and inclusive as well as healthy, resilient and sustainable. Our new World Fish 2030 research and innovation strategy that Sandy mentioned at the beginning 
aims to link the global agriculture research and innovation agenda, including the global nutrition discourse, to the emerging blue economy and the ocean space. These offer largely untapped opportunities through sustainable development of aquaculture, fisheries, as well as alternative aquatic foods. And these are not without their own challenges. If aquatic food systems are to be part of a sustainable and inclusive future of shared prosperity for all and a healthy planet, there are three things we need to accomplish. First, we need to ensure the sustainable production of diverse aquatic foods from both aquaculture and fisheries so that we can minimize the impact on the environment and increase our resilience and adaption to climate risk. Second, we need to ensure aquatic foods are affordable and accessible so that we can maximize social and economic impacts for shared prosperity and inclusive growth. And lastly, third, we need to ensure aquatic foods are safe to eat and are part of the solution to key nutrition and public health challenges. In many low and middle income countries, the emerging aquaculture sector requires significant investment in skills, knowledge and inputs in order to take off. Equally, investments in improved fisheries management and governance systems are critical to address important food system trade-offs. Efforts to foster innovative approaches to public-private partnerships and research policy collaboration are crucial here. That's why today's event is really timely, really important. Together, we need to mobilize a global movement to embolden these shifts to a more sustainable food system where the research community, policymakers, investors, business leaders, local producers, processors and traders and consumers create shared value and co-design interventions that make aquaculture as a critical component of global aquatic food systems an integral part of the food system transformation agenda. So with these thoughts in mind, I'm really excited to hear from the authors of the study and the panel's perspective. Over to you, Sandy. Thanks very much for listening. Well, thanks so much, um, uh, Gareth, for that really stirring um, presentation, actually. And I think what you've said there is something that, you know, it's so timely in terms of the um, UN Food Summit discussions that are going on. And in many ways, I think um, the, the community, I hope, joining us today will play their part in taking forward the really insightful remarks that you've just made. Now, unfortunately, Sir John Beddington is not able to join us. He's got um, communication problems. So I'm going to ask um, Mr. Ivan Kent, who's Deputy Director at the Global Panel, uh, to uh, give the speech on Sir John's behalf. And Sir John may be able to join us later. But first of all, I'm just going to make a few introductory remarks about uh, uh, Sir John Bennington. Just a reminder, in case you haven't um, had um, a contact much with the Global Panel before, that he is uh, Chair of the uh, Global Panel on Agriculture and Food Systems for Nutrition. He's also Chair of the Oxford Martin School, and he's a Professor of uh, Natural Resource Management at Oxford University. And from 2006 to 2013, Sir John was UK Government Chief Scientific Advisor. And he too has considerable expertise in fisheries and indeed was given a prestigious award by Her Majesty the Queen um, in 2004 for his services to fisheries and fisheries management. So I'm going to hand over to you, Ivan, uh, to kindly give Sir John's speech um, uh, on his behalf. Well, thank you very much, Sandy, and apologies that Sir John's unable to join us today due to some technical issues, but I have got some notes here from his, uh, from his brief and what he wanted to say to everybody uh, on this uh, occasion of this event. So first of all, really to thank World Fish for agreeing to co-host this launch, um, and especially to uh, Dr. Gareth Johnson for his uh, insightful remarks. Um, so I should first say a few words about the Global Panel for those who are less familiar with our work. So the panel is an independent international group formally established in August 2013 at the Nutrition for Growth Summit in London and funded by the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. The panel has very esteemed membership, including former World Prize Food Prize winners and high profile leaders in nutrition, health and agriculture. And as a result, um, the panel has a very extensive network that allows us to gain um, an audience with policymakers at the very highest level, especially in low and middle income countries. So we combine our work in country with the production of evidence-based technical policy brief. And since 2013, we've produced 18 such briefs covering many aspects of the food system. 
Now, we're here today to uh, co-launch with uh, World uh, Fish our latest brief, and that presents evidence on how aquaculture can deliver diverse benefits. So, for example, um, among these, contributing to more resilient and sustainable food systems, enhancing the quality of diets and the health of populations through improved nutrition, providing new employment and trade opportunities, and, if managed sustainably, reducing pressure on capture fisheries. So aquaculture is arguably the fastest growing agricultural subsector, with global production projected to reach 105 million tonnes per year by 2029. Global fish consumption has also grown by 3.1% per year since the 1960s, outpacing growth in consumption of other animal source foods, which grew by 2.1% each year. So the projected demand for fish is also expected to increase by 16.3% by the end of the decade, which is creating pressure on capture fisheries, which are being overfished and under threat from climate change. So it's estimated that one third of capture fisheries stocks are being overfished. So aquaculture can clearly be part of the solution, addressing challenges we face on nutrition and health, since fish represents a key component of healthy diets worldwide, given the protein, omega-3, fatty acid, and micronutrient pr profile it contains. On the environment, because aquaculture, if managed sustainably, will take pressure off capture fisheries and help reduce the reliance on terrestrial protein sources and on employment, with around 20.5 million people globally employed in aquaculture in 2018. Now, it's important to note that capture fisheries will also continue to have an important role to play in providing nutrient-rich foods and supporting livelihoods of smallholders in low- and middle-income countries, but we must strive to make them more sustainable. Now, the Global Panel, alongside many other partner organisations, we have called for food system transformation. However, the contribution that aquaculture can play is often overlooked. And the argument for better including aquaculture in wider food systems dialogues is very compelling. And we will hear more on this from our speakers shortly. Finally, as we build to the UN Food Systems Summit, let us ensure that the importance of aquaculture is recognized and acted upon. It's important that this is supported by sound evidence and scientific research. The new World Fish 2030 Research and Innovation Strategy sets out how aquatic food systems can contribute to the global sustainable development agenda. And with their partners, World Fish is expanding the scope of traditional agricultural research beyond land crops and livestock to ha harness aquatic foods. Policymakers need to be aware of the multiple policy wins that aquaculture and sustainable fisheries can offer. It can support food policy, health, agriculture, environment, addressing inequality, employment and trade policies. So thanks again to everybody who's taken the time to join. Um, I look forward to listening in on the discussion. And final thanks again to World Fish for um, co-hosting this important event. And I hand back to Professor Sandy Thomas. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ivan, for standing in at short notice. And hopefully Sir John will be able to join us uh, before too long. Um, so, and thank you to um, Gareth particularly for, for, for coming in um, uh, at the beginning. So we can really see that the global call to trans food transform global food systems um, really has an opportunity to encompass aquaculture alongside fisheries um, to make a really substantial uh, contribution and particularly around the, the research agenda as well. So just before we move to our two main speakers, um, we'd like to hear from you, the audience. So we're going to put up um, our first poll, which should be coming up now, so we can find out a little bit more about who has joined us today. So we've now got 182 uh, people here. So the first question is, where are you joining us from today? This will give us some insight. So we've got Africa, Asia Pacific, Europe, Central Latin America, North America, and also what type of organization you work for. And you'll see the usual kind of categories there, um, government, NGO, um, and uh, academia and research, public and private sector. So if you could kindly fill those in, I only take a second, um, it would give us some insight into how the community uh, is spread out, who's joining us today. Um, and uh, very shortly, 
um, the technical teams I know will be working on this, uh, we should get the results so we can share um, with you what kind of um, community we have and what kind of uh, representatives we have in terms of the different sectors. So um, if we've got the results ready before we pass on to our two uh, main speakers, that would be great. Okay, so we can see here that we've got yeah, we've got quite a spread. So we've got 24% um, from Africa, a similar amount from Asia and the Pacific, uh, quite a lot from Europe. And we can also see um, that predominantly we've got a big representation from academia and research, NGOs, and also some from government. So that's really quite a, a decent spread and very grateful to you all for joining us. So we'll just close that off now. Um, and I'm going to um, move next to uh, our two um, uh, main speakers, and I'd just like to um, introduce them. So we're going to hear, as I said, more about the evidence and recommendations from the brief. We're first going to hear from Dr. Andrew Thorne Lyman, um, uh, who's the lead author of the brief. Uh, hi, hi there, Andrew, I know you're with us. And we're also going to hear from Professor Patrick Webb. Uh, hi, Patrick, I know you're with us too. And I'm just going to introduce them both together and then hand over to Andrew. So Dr. Thorne Lyman um, is Associate Scientist at the Center for Human Nutrition at the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Uh, before his appointment as an aquatic foods uh, consumption specialist at John Hopkins, he was a senior nutrition specialist uh, and team leader at World Fish in uh, Malaysia, and also a lecturer at the, Har the Harvard T. H. Chan uh, School of Public Health. And Professor Patrick Webb is the Alexander McFarlane um, Professor of Nutrition at Tufts University. Uh, and he's also technical advisor to the Global Panel. He was previously Chief of Nutrition for the UN World Food Programme and also a research fellow at the International Food Policy Research Institute, uh, IFPRI. Thank you very much. So I'm now gonna hand over to you, Andrew. Hi, Andrew, can you hear Hi. me? Yes, uh, I'm just okay. getting my slides up. Thank you very Great. much. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, good morning and afternoon, everybody. And thank you to the Global Panel for letting me be part of this important brief and event. I'm gonna be speaking today about the importance of aquatic foods and healthy diets. About half the world's supply of fish comes from capture fisheries and the other half from aquaculture. Many of you being from academia are probably familiar with this figure. While the amount of wild caught fish increased steadily from the 1950s to 1990s, since then it's leveled off. The main focus of this brief is on aquaculture, but it's also important to acknowledge that fisheries have an extremely important role in the livelihoods and providing for the food of people throughout the world and must be supported. Aquaculture ranks as one of the most rapidly growing food sectors globally. And it's this growth potential and the ability to influence it in different ways that makes today's discussion and the topics in this brief so important. This figure illustrates aquaculture production throughout the world. Asia is responsible for the vast majority of all aquaculture production globally and most of the growth that I was just discussing. China's at the heart of aqua global production of aquaculture and trade is illustrated in this figure, while other countries, including Vietnam, Indonesia, India, and Bangladesh are also major producers. In contrast, when you look at Sub-Saharan Africa, you can see the production is low, but it's expected to grow more rapidly over the next decade than any other continent. In this map, you can see that Nigeria stands out as an important producer. Now, aquaculture encompasses a vast array of different types of systems. Um, and I'm just gonna cover, cover a few here. Uh, these range from traditional aquaculture systems, which are common throughout Asia and which are often extensive in nature. They're, they're often practiced by households with few other livelihood options. Um, these are off, and then there's also pond aquaculture, which can be intensive or semi-intensive. Um, for example, it often involves pelleted fed carp in, in China and Vietnam, as well as integrated systems, which can also include livestock and vegetable farming. Cage-based aquaculture in lakes and rivers is common throughout Southeast Asia in particular, and 
and also involves the use of pelleted feed. While mariculture, which is not grown as quickly as the others, um, in, involves things like mollusks. Over half of, of mariculture right now involves um, production of mollusks, finfish, and crustaceans. Each of these different types of systems have vastly different environmental footprints. And they produce different types of fish as well and seafood. This figure illustrates the supply of fish available for consumption for each country. And we often rely on this measure or apparent consumption to approximate consumption because it's difficult to measure fish consumption, but also because we don't really have standard comparable methods that have been used across countries to assess uh, what people are eating in terms of fish. There are several patterns that are of interest here. And, and what, the first is that you can see that the fish supply is, is higher in Asia. Fish consumption tends to be higher in coastal countries or countries with inland fisheries. And in Africa, fish consumption is quite low compared with the rest of the world. Fish has a number of important nutritional attributes which are appreciated to different degrees by different stakeholders. Especially in the world of aquaculture and fisheries, you often see the importance of fish framed around its protein content. And it's indeed a, a very important source of balanced amino acids in the diets of many people throughout the world. In the world of nutrition, where, I'm, where I come from, uh, people often talk about the fatty acid content of fish as being the primary thing of interest um, because uh, fish is one of the few sources of long chain polyunsaturated omega-3 fatty acids in particular. Increasingly, you hear stakeholders in the world of nutrition and aquaculture and fisheries talking about the content of micronutrients, which are vitamins and minerals. Um, and I'm going to be talking about some of those benefits in a second. Now, species vary dramatically in their nutritional profile. And here you can see uh, the vitamin B12, calcium, and, and omega-3 uh, omega fatty acid profile of a number of different species of fish in Bangladesh. There are thousands of wild-caught fish, different species of wild-caught fish, and about 560 species have been cultivated in aquaculture systems by humans. These species vary dramatically in their nutritional content is shown here, which is a function of the edible portion, for example, fillets versus consuming the fish whole, the biology and the habitat in which they're fed. For many species, we don't even know their nutritional content, but we have a pretty good knowledge of how things look in some countries like Bangladesh. You can see that some of the species in inland capture fisheries, which are presented towards the top of this figure, are very high in micronutrients and fatty acids. Many common species that are cultivated in inland aquaculture have a lower micronutrient and fatty acid profile. And this really argues also for the importance of maintaining fisheries and also continuing to grow aquaculture and to develop new production technologies um, that can help to maximize the nutritional profile of the fish. This figure is from the Global Burden of Disease Project, which aims to um, to estimate the leading causes of mortality and morbidity globally. And their estimates place um, dietary risk factors at the top of all of the causes of mortality. And this figure shows, breaks it out into different types of dietary risk factors. You can see that low consumption of seafood, omega-3 fatty acids ranks here as the sixth global cause of diet-related mortality. You can also see, if you look hard, it's, it's a bit difficult to see, but that lower middle-income countries, um, for lower and middle-income countries, the burden is even higher than other countries. There have also been um, a variety of studies that have looked at cohort studies in humans um, and compared the effects of consuming different types of diets. And so we know that the Mediterranean, in the Mediterranean diet, um, fish features prominently. You can see here, um, the pescatarian diet is shown in, um, in red. You can see that both the pescatarian and Mediterranean diets are associated with lower all-cause mortality and certain types of morbidity as well. And so um, these bars show the percentage reduction in the risk of each disease or mortality associated with different diets 
compared with the standard omnivorous diets in each setting. Um, and so you can see here that uh, type 2 diabetes, cancer, coronary mortality, and all-cause mortality are lower among populations and individuals within populations that are consuming uh, these diets compared with the standard omnivorous diet. Looking through the dietary guidelines of countries throughout the world, and most recently the U.S. Um, just came out with their uh, recent dietary guidelines, guidelines um, you often see that um, fish is recommended and seafood consumption is recommended during pregnancy. And one of the main reasons for that is that consumption of fish in pregnancy is associated with better child development outcomes, including cognitive language and communication development. And for that reason, um, oftentimes, it, like in, for example, in the United States, you see that um, fish consumption is recommended about 225 to 285 grams of fish is recommended in pregnancy. So now I'm gonna pass uh, the uh, PowerPoint share over to Patrick um, to continue the presentation. I can manage this. Thank you, uh, Andrew. And thank you everyone who's um, spoken so far. It's a great pleasure and honor um, to be part of this uh, launch. Um, especially for those where it's early morning or late evening, uh, even night time. So um, picking up from where Andrew just left in terms of what we understand about the, the, the contribution of fish, of course, aquatic products more generally, but this, this uh, policy brief is very much focused on pond aquaculture. Uh, as opposed to the whole range of aquatic products. Um, but Andrew talked very eloquently about the, the health dimensions of uh, pescatarian diets. And it's that um, evidence, that science, which has led the, the call for increased fish consumption, usually increased, uh, in most national food-based dietary guidelines. These are national. Right. What are, the bars here are based on 85 different uh, countries, uh, food-based dietary guidelines, and what is circled on the left-hand side there, the blue is the most commonly recommended. The number of countries arguing uh, that are meeting uh, dietary guidelines is in relation to fish, and it's because fish is one of the most commonly promoted um, products in countries where fish, of course, is part, culturally part and tr traditionally part of the diet. Um, and some calculations, some modeling that was done um, for the global panel um, noted that ha were there full adoption, if everyone in the countries that have existing national food-based dietary guidelines, if they actually uh, adhered to the guidance, there'd be double digit reduction in preventable, preventable or cause mortality and a double digit reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Right? So we always have to remember that aquatic agriculture has the double win, in potential double win, of improving human health and also planetary health from the dimension of reduced greenhouse gas emissions. But that, of course, depends on the technologies used, the way products are um, generated. Now you heard already uh, from the DG that agriculture is uh, one of the fastest uh, growing sectors in, uh, of agriculture uh, globally, uh, but it's starting from a very low point. Aquaculture is um, the smallest component of all the animal source food uh, production sectors. And it's also uh, one of the smallest food sectors in terms of total food um, output. But in terms of percentage growth, you see oh, well over 7.5% uh, per annum growth in, in output, aquaculture is booming. And it's booming very much in low and middle income countries where demand is growing in line with poverty reduction and therefore income growth. So that presents huge opportunities, multi-win possibilities, where human health can benefit from the fish contribution to healthy diets, ideally 
sustained healthy diets, sustainable healthy diets, and but also employment, employment not just in the direct uh, fisheries and aquaculture sector, but in all value chain and retail uh, segments of, of the uh, food value chain. This simply shows the uh, orange is uh, employment in thousands in Asia, so you're looking at very large numbers in Asia, 20 million or so. In Africa, much smaller, but still 400,000 plus and still counting people employed in aquaculture and its uh, side uh, benefits. So huge potential, right? We're at a time when many of these countries in Africa and Asia are looking for how, how to generate employment. Here is one, here is one domain of agriculture that has huge rapid growth potential. So income growth would ha ha can happen at all levels, and clearly there's potential in agriculture for smallholder production, not large scale uh, plantation corporate level. Uh, fish production uh, can be done in small plots, and it can be done, in fact, in tandem with other kinds of, let's say, fruit and veg production, or even rice production. Uh, the, the, the potential for using small ponds in a multi-polyculture uh, approach is quite um, important. Equally important, though, is the potential for innovation and income creation along the value chain. Now, that, however, will happen only if market demand is effective for smallholder products as opposed to imported products that compete, and if the information and financing mechanisms are available for small and medium ent sized enterprises uh, to take up the challenge. One of the major challenges is, of course, uh, food loss and waste. Uh, it, this is important for all perishable foods. Uh, Nutrient-rich foods just happen to often be more perishable than staples, grains, and roots and tubers. And the, the perishability of fish is uh, certainly well known. And it uh, speak, one of the constraints to ensuring local uh, production reaching consumers that are not uh, in situ is not just loss and waste, but perceptions of food safety and perceptions of adulteration of fish to make fish look uh, as if they're fresh. There needs to be, and there is huge potential for, technology, best practice, uh, regulatory, appropriate regulatory mechanisms to support cold storage along the value chain. The just simple things like the availability of ice and, and salt for, for salting and canning. Um, transport infrastructure, ensuring that the time from production or harvest of fish to consumption uh, is minimized. Preservation techniques and, and so on. Uh, there has to be much greater attention to protecting what has been produced for the food system and ensuring that it stays in the food system as much as possible all along the value chain. There are, there are challenges, right? I've, I've already talked about um, financing, access to technology and information. Let's not forget, yes, there are issues relating to pollutants, uh, antimicrobial use and, and resistance. Um, the, the salination uh, of, of water courses. A lot of negatives uh, have been raised uh, to counter the, the, try and counter the growth of aquaculture. Many of those are being resolved. Many of them have solutions. Uh, one of the key solutions, of course, is a food systems approach, which links very closely to a One Health uh, approach, which doesn't segment or silo products or production systems, but allows for integrated, joined up thinking and solutions across human, animal and environmental health. This approach has to be embedded in future food systems so that policies, investments and programs uh, understand the, both the, the positive and negative externalities of choosing one way of doing business versus another. This brief comes in the, in the context, as uh, Ivan Kent mentioned, of other briefs and other products from the global panel. Uh, the most recent uh, Foresight report, uh, published just a few months ago, 
looks to the future in terms of global food systems transformation to try and achieve this human and planetary health simultaneously. Uh, for this to happen, many aspects of the food system have to be fixed. And we've wrapped a lot of these into four quadrants. You could see them as four segments of, of the food chain. But we need to understand that aquatic products have to be part of this overall food system tran transformation with transition steps needed to get us there. So it's not just crops and animals, but fish, to, for them to be uptaken by consumers, that it has to be a desirable feature of healthy, sustainable uh, diets. We have to ensure that uh, food-based dietary diet guidelines are not just promoting this in, in a vacuum. It has to be possible. It has to be desired by consumers, which requires education, information, advocacy, marketing of many different kinds to ensure that people understand why this is so important to the consumer. But if it's in demand, which it is, it has to also be affordable. Uh, relative prices of perishable goods that are nutrient rich um, are often out of balance, let's say, with uh, cheaper, uh, less nutrient dense foods. So the affordability of healthy products, such as fish, is a key element and more equity, equitable growth, pro poor growth, redesign of social protection programs that focus on public procurement. These have to be considered again in terms of their ability to support um, healthy diets in better ways. Accessibility, for the, as I said, the fish has to get from its source to the consumer, wherever the consumer may be. That requires uh, attention to trade, food loss and waste and more. And then production, uh, a rebalancing of, the, of the, the subsidies that go across the agricultural sector, the R&D sector. Uh, fish and fish products uh, are relatively neglected in relation to the investments that go to staple grains, for example. And we need to try and rebalance uh, how that goes. Coming to the end, the, the brief puts us a range of examples and recommendations, some for, for governments, the obvious one, is don't ignore fish and aquatic products. They are fundamental to agriculture and a growing part of agriculture activities and employment. This means that agriculture policy needs to pay much more attention to these particular value chains, but so do trade policies. So do national food-based dietary guidelines. Food policy, nutrition issues have to be embedded in those investments for fish. Uh, and outside the government, um, a lot more research is needed to understand how to manage better the threat of antimicrobial uh, resistance, how better to improve sustainability, how better to reduce loss and waste. The brief is here, it can be downloaded directly, open access, and we very much welcome everyone's comments, questions, and discussion around these important issues. Thank you. Thanks um, so much to both of you, uh, Dr. Thorne uh, Lyman and, and uh, Professor Patrick Webb for those two presentations, which I think really sets the scene uh, for the discussion later on. We do want you to keep your questions uh, coming in. There is uh, the chat box as well, but there's also the Q&A box. So we will have some time, hopefully 20, 25 minutes at the end uh, for questions. Before we turn to our uh, distinguished panel, I just want to run another audience poll. Um, and this really is to get your attention, thinking about what are the main challenges facing the development of sustainable aquaculture. And uh, we're gonna get this list up, here it is already. And you can see that uh, there's a choice here of four, improving the quality of fish stocks, reducing food loss and waste, uh, introducing non-capture fish feed and um, uh, managing um, antimicrobial um, use and resistance. And you've heard about all of those factors, I think, um, just now from our two speakers. Um, so do vote. It would be interesting to see uh, where people think the challenges are, and that'll give us some reflection of, of uh, um, how 
much that shared um, uh, uh, shared challenges there are in terms of whether people are specialising, for example, in, in one area more than another, or where there is an area which is not really capturing the attention that it might deserve. Um, so uh, I think our technical team is working on the analysis here. So um, if we could have the results as soon as they're available, uh, that would be great. And then shortly after that, we're going to move to our three panel speakers um, to give us their perspectives uh, in their own particular area of expertise. So here we go. So actually, uh, I've got a very uh, even distribution there um, around, you know, uh, 20, 21, ranging 21 to 28 percent of, of um uh, of uh, views around those. So I think what we can say there is that there's appreciation that all these challenges are really important. And I think with um, both Andrew and Patrick's framing of, uh, of, of the challenges here in the food systems context, we can see uh, that there are going to be lots of ideas out there from adjacent fields. So thank you very much for that. So now uh, we're going to move to the uh, panel um, uh, uh, phase of our of our event here, and we're really delighted to have uh, three really distinguished speakers. And I'm going to go to each of them uh, in turn. Um, they're going to uh, put their views across, but I'm firstly going to start uh, with um, our panelist Shakuntala uh, Thisted, the research program leader for value chains and nutrition at World Fish. So welcome, uh, Shakuntala. And she's got long experience, 25 years experience uh, of research in global food security and nutrition in low and middle income countries. And she was recently appointed vice chair of the Advancing Equitable Livelihoods Action Track uh, in the 2021 uh, UN Food Systems Summit. So hi, Shakuntala. Um, now you've worked, um, and I can see, you know, from your your um, uh, your your history, your career history, that you've worked in many different countries, and you focus particularly on introducing nutrition sensitive uh, aquaculture approaches. And obviously, these um, these approaches will be drawing on complementary sectors: agriculture, health, uh, social protection, early child development, education, all of these things together, and to try and, um, if, try and influence the underlying determinants of nutrition. So I, it would be great if you could give us um, a kind of background in the time that you've got to your approach that you've taken, this nutrition-sensitive approach to aquaculture, and set out some of the impact that it's had. So over to you, Shakuntala. Thank you, Sandy, and thank you so much for having me on the panel. Yes, I've worked a lot with uh, what I call nutrition sensitive aquaculture systems and started in Bangladesh with the entry point of homestead ponds and ponds connected with rice fields, as well as water bodies in wetlands as the water as the floodwaters recede and you have closed water bodies. We have focused on the diversity of species in the ponds and closed water bodies increasing total production and productivity, increasing the number of species that we produce, and most importantly, the quantity, uh, the quantity of multiple nutrients produced, especially micronutrients, for example, vitamin B12, vitamin A, calcium, iron, and zinc, as Andrew has told us about the importance of these micronutrients to human nutrition, and also essential fatty acids. This approach has resulted in increased income for the households from sale of the fish and increased intake of fish from the of fish produced in the households. And importantly, what we have seen is that the larger sized fish, for example, in Bangladesh, the carp species have been sold and up to 60% of the small fish have been maintained at home for consumption. We integrated production of micronutrient rich vegetables on the pond dikes and homestead gardens focusing on orange sweet potato. And with that, we also integrated nutrition messaging, focusing on the consumption of micronutrient rich small fish and vegetables, and the benefits of these foods to women and children in the first thousand days of life. We included women's engagements at all levels. Recent research 
con con uh, conducted together with Patrick Webb and his team at Tufts University, have confirmed that this approach leads to better dietary quality and micronutrient intakes, especially in women and young children. This new nutrition sensitive pond polyculture approach has now spread to several countries in Asia and the Pacific. In our newly launched World Fish Strategy, we know that we would like to continue working with the supply of nutritious and safe aquatic foods from, aqu from aquaculture. This is a priority. Importantly, we would also focus on sustainable and resilient aquaculture approaches, not just thinking about increasing the quantities of aquatic foods, as we have heard from the DG, Garrett Johnson. In addition, we will be working with new aquaculture solutions for nutritious foods. For example, building up an initiative on seaweeds with multiple partners. In the lead up to the United Nations Food Systems Summit in July and October of this year, reports and discussions like the one we are having today are of critical importance so that aquatic foods finds its right place within food systems and must be used in the decision making at the highest levels as this will influence the policies and investments of member states. Over to you, Sandy. Thanks so much for those insights. And I'm sure that um, that account of, of the success that you've had is going to spark some interest in the, in the discussion. And it's great that you're active within um, the action track as vice chair that we were talking about earlier. So thank you so much, Shakuntala. We'll be coming back to you uh, during the questions. So uh, the next member of our panel is uh, Dr. Sunila Ray, who is currently working uh, in Nepal. Um, and she's the program coordinator of the fisheries program in the Faculty um, of Animal Science, uh, Vet Science and Fisheries at AFU. And in addition to doing quite a lot of teaching, she's involved in aquaculture research and extension with a focus on nutrition and gender. So Professor Sunila, um, I think it's interesting here, of course, that um, Nepal is a landlocked country. Uh, and so all of the aquaculture is in land. Uh, and not, um, not at all at the sea. So, um, Professor Sunila, I wonder if you can tell us about um, the approaches that you've used uh, in that sort of small scale inland setting uh, in Nepal. Over to you. Thank you, Sandy, for this question and also having me in the panelists. Uh, yes, you are absolutely correct. The Nepal is the land of country and we have only the first water aquaculture in Nepal. But aquaculture is emerging in Nepal and is one of the fastest growing agriculture subsector in the country. However, the carp polyculture is the Tarai, the southern part of Nepal is the main farming system and more than 90% of the fish production comes from the carp. Regarding the, my work uh, in the women in aquaculture, which I started in 2008 with the Women Empowerment Project, and that was funded by the Danida. And uh, initially I worked with around 126 new women farmers and uh, that was in the small scale, the home state pond. And we started our work in the two districts of Nepal that uh, in the Tarai region of Nepal. And what we did is that we introduced the simple and the sustainable technology to our farmers. That was the carp seeds polyculture. The, since Nepal is self-reliant in the carp seed production, the feed sourcing, the fingerling was not difficult for us. And uh, we sourced the, the seed or the wood of the, the seeds from the surrounding the natural water. And what we did is that we use the local, the farm by products as the feed to feed the fish. That's why the technology was the simple for farmers and they easily adopted this technology. Now what we did also is that we trained the women farmers in fish farming 
and also took them to the field trips for observation of the established farm. And even we took the, some of the lead farmers to Bangladesh to observe the advanced technology. The international exposure gave them the self-confidence and which was later there that uh, reflected in their work. Now, what we did afterwards is that we uh, organized those women farmers into the small uh, self-help groups, and later these groups were converted into the cooperatives, and now there are the three the cooperatives in Nepal, that, uh, not in Nepal, but in the uh, Chitwan and the Noval Parasi district where I work. Then, after the establishment of these the self-help groups and the cooperatives, we started to work on the capacity building of women farmers. What we did is that we gave them the training and also provided the logistic support from the projects that was supported by the this government and the project was the training project. Uh, after the harvest, the fish marketing for the fish farmer was not a difficult task because the harvest size was not that much big because the farmers, they um, produced fish in a small pond and more than 50% farmers consume at home. So on harvest, the farmers sold their fish in, uh, personally at uh, the, uh, the farm gate and also they show their the leftover fees to the through the uh, middleman in the local market now the regarding the challenge which i faced during the implementation of this project is that the bringing the women from the kitchen to the uh, meeting venue that was the biggest challenge for me and uh, what we did is that uh, we convinced the young ladies, which were, who were going uh, college going, the students, and later these young ladies convinced their parents and also the other ladies in the community. So in this way, we solved this uh, challenge, and uh, this approach has the positive impacts among the farmers. Like the farmers are now self-sustained in the fish farming and they have increased the confidence that they have diversified the, the fish farming into the another label, like that they integrated the fish farming with the vegetable, periphyton enhancement system they adopted, and also they have started to grow the fast growing species like the pandas, African catfish, and tilapia. And some of the farmers are also engaged in the value chain development like that they are engaged in the shelling the fish through the fish shop, etc. And uh, moreover, the women, they are the in power, like the three women farmers now, they are the serving as the member in the Fisheries Association of Nepal, which is the umbrella organization for the fish farmers. And one women farmer is also the board member in the Central Fisheries Association of Nepal which is the remarkable achievement for our women farmer. And in addition to this, there is also the young the women graduate from the cooperative who has been continuously served the, that means she got the continuously the employment in the FIDIS project from the 2013. Since the technology that we introduced was very simple and sustainable and suitable to the small scale farmers, now this technology has been spread to the six district and the one NGO, the Monterey Development Institute, which has been continuously working on this the small scale farming through this CARPSIS polyculture. Now, Another, the positive impact of this project it has been seen in the education. That means the university students got opportunity to do their research in the farmer's field. From there, not only they got the, uh, the research data, but also they got the opportunity to learn the practical knowledge from the field. And another, the positive effect of this the project is that the Aquaculture Innovation Lab, 
the shop protect not only the farmers but also the fisheries program in the agriculture and forestry university where i work as a professor as a program coordinator and this the uh, innovation lab project supported in the infrastructure development and also to develop the academic the department to the fisheries program in afu Lastly, I would like to address the government role to scale up or the, in the sustainability of the approach which you used is that the, in the new the government system, that means now we have the federal system and the, all the agricultural uh, the programs or the planning, these are done at the local uh, government level. And this global government has the programs for the fisheries and the aquaculture. But the problem is that they are focused to the cooperatives. That's why to support these small scale farmers, that we need to engage them to the cooperatives. And uh, also that the Nepal does not have the fishery policy until now, but it is already drafted and we are looking forward to the space in that the policy so thank you very much sandy over to you thanks so much um professor sunila and i think what's so striking about the description that you've just given given us is all the different um different sectors and the different groups that are involved whether it's universities research institutes farmers groups of women national fish associations um all playing their part so i think that's tremendously encouraging and um, very useful for people who are interested in, in, building, in building up aquaculture um, at the national level. So thank you very much. We'll be coming back to you, I'm sure, uh, for some questions. So just moving on, um, our final panelist um, uh, is from Africa, um, Dr. Sloan uh, Chimatiro, who's president of the Policy uh, Research Network for Fisheries and Aquaculture, which is an AU uh, institution. And uh, Dr. Uh, Chimatiro uh, is a fisheries and aquaculture specialist who's been working for more than three decades in fisheries and aquaculture research, focusing particularly on policy reform and management. He's worked for, for, for World Fish, for NAPAD and policy think tanks. So I think, um, Sloans, we're really interested to hear from you um, in terms of the the voice of capture um, fisheries and aquaculture and their role in Africa. Now we hear, and we've heard today, of course, that the consumption uh, of fish and other aquatic foods in Africa uh, is still relatively small compared to many other parts of the world. So I've got two points that it would be great if you could address. First, with increasing demands and with populations um, growing and income growth rising, how can the demand for aquaculture products be met in the future? And then secondly, what could you tell us about the policies and investments that you think are needed both nationally, um, but also regionally to ensure that there's both equity in supply and equity in consumption of aquaculture uh, products? So you've got about six, six, seven minutes, and then we're gonna turn over to the, use the last remaining time for our question. So over to you, uh, Chimatiro. Thanks so much, Professor Sande, and thanks for having me in this panel. Yes, you're right, this is very important. Uh, we wait, of course, we know that uh, aquaculture is fairly small in Africa, but it is a sector that is, that is growing. Um, recent studies have been done by FAO and NEPAD have revealed that, uh, you know, almost $3 billion uh, is being generated every year and contributing to, you know, gross domestic product. And although the sector is small, but we see that uh, it constitutes a, a larger, you know, sizable proportion of the agriculture GDP, close to 1%, and almost 4% uh, of the people involved are women. And so this is very important. Um, obviously, the dwindling uh, wild stocks um, is, is a major challenge, but Africa faces another challenge. Uh, we know that with the rise in population, um, the, the arable land, uh, sizes are also decreasing and therefore the only hope for Africa to produce sustainable food in the future really um, is provided by aquaculture and therefore uh, we see this as a, a very important element but um, this needs to be realized of course I mean many policymakers always ask um, where is the potential? Tell us how can this uh, be translated into actual food and actual fish, besides also, you know, fish 
generally is competing against the grants. Uh, when we talk about food security in Africa, often is equated to grain security, and therefore there is a challenge here. But of course, we see studies that have been carried out in a number of African countries, a rising number of people that are consuming uh, fish, both in the rural and urban areas. Uh, but this needs to be harnessed. I think very importantly, we need to ensure that uh, uh, there is scientific capacity to develop uh, technologies that can um, uh, enhance uh, productivity of uh, aquaculture. Uh, where we don't have the capacity for science, at least we must have people that will be able to look around for appropriate technologies and adapt them. Uh, the second important thing is actually to have uh, scaling strategies uh, to enable small scale poor resource fish farmers uh, to access and use technologies. Having technologies is one thing, but getting them to be used to produce fish uh, is, is a major challenge, especially for small scale uh, farmers. And therefore we need to ensure that farmers um, are assisted through a scaling strategy. The third and very important uh, is to ensure that we put in place strategies that will make input and output markets uh, to work for these uh, poor resource farmers. From a policy point of view, Africa has put in place three important uh, frameworks. The first one is African Union um, policy framework and reform strategy for fisheries and aquaculture, um, which is the, the common African policy for fish. And uh, in there, one of the major priorities is aquaculture. Uh, the second is of course the um, agenda 2063, uh, which highlights the importance of aquaculture and the need for African countries to put aquaculture at the center of uh, national development. The third and most important one, of course, is the Africa Regional uh, Nutritional Strategy. Uh, which also emphasizes um, nutritional sense. And this is where actually aquaculture can fit in uh, to ensure that um, you know, those benefits that have been highlighted by uh, Professor Andrew can actually be realized. But of course, at the country level, we need a number of steps. And this is extremely important, uh, is that the countries need to align their national aquaculture policies um, with the continental policies that the ones I've, I've listed. Uh, the key role for ministries responsible for aquaculture or departments of fisheries is to ensure that the national aquaculture strategic plans are aligned with the national food and nutritional um, security strategies. Um, we have good examples on the continent. Zambia is one of them, where World Fish was embedded into the National uh, Council for Food and Nutritional Security, and this gave an opportunity to ensure that uh, fish is uh, integrated. The third is that uh, you know, research must generate uh, the evidence of the role of farmed fish uh, in nutrition and health diets. And this is critically important because policymakers, if they give, they're not given uh, the requisite evidence, it would be really hard. Uh, another area that we need is to ensure that we can improve aquaculture productivity so there's more fish. Because policymakers all say, well, aquaculture is not produced much. Why should we waste time with this? But countries also need to improve the market infrastructure to enable access to fish. Um, there is evidence that a lot of food uh, in Africa is being accessed through markets. And therefore, if markets are not functional, uh, it's going to be really difficult, particularly for the rural people to access uh, this nutritious food. Uh, we also need to ensure that uh, we can advocate for incorporation of fish in national uh, food balance sheets. Particularly, we need to ensure that um, this integration focuses on the qualitative value of fish as a nutritious food, not the quantities, the cages, uh, so that people can actually uh, wake up to realize that fish can play a better role, um, but also more efficiently than actually spending a lot of money uh, on fortification of food. Uh, we also think that it would be important for departments of fisheries to uh, design and implement uh, visible interventions like homegrown school feeding programs uh, that include aquaculture. Uh, but more importantly, we think that uh, fish needs to be inclu included uh, in public procurement uh, programs, especially for uh, humanitarian programs. Um, and this is where I think the WFP and World Fish uh, National uh, Departments of Fisheries, they need to work together to ensure that these parameters are included, uh, including also quality assurance, uh, so that we can assure 
uh, the consumers that uh, when fish is integrated, uh, it will make a, a major difference. Um, so I think these are some of the major areas. We have uh, seen that uh, all the regional economic communities, SADIC, ECOWAS, uh, East African community and others have actually included aquaculture as one of the key elements and these need to be supported accordingly. Thank you so much. Back to you, Professor Sanders. Thanks so much. Um, that, was a that was a really um, uh, very insightful um, uh, account of the kinds of things, the, the kinds of opportunities, but also the challenges uh, in, in Africa. So thanks so much, um, uh, Sloan's, uh, for that. So uh, we're now going to move to the last part of our, um, our event. And so we've got a little bit of time left, 20 minutes. Um, for some questions. And we've had some questions submitted, so I'm just going to put them to the panelists. I am going to ask um, all of our distinguished speakers um, who've spoken today, if they could just be really brief, because if they are, that means I can bring in um, more people at this crucial time, because we need just a couple of minutes at the very end to say our final thanks and so on. So I'm going to put a question first um, to, uh, to Sloan's and then, um, and then Gareth. Um, if you could both comment briefly, and this is really about a question around COVID, and it's about the economic disruption um, that the COVID-19 pandemic is creating. Um, do you see um, that this, will, this might be a serious barrier to the, the kind of pushing forward uh, of this important agenda that we've been hearing about? So first, uh, to Gareth, if you could just perhaps give us your take on that. You've had long experience um, over your career in uh, thinking about capacity building and institutional organization. So it'd be great to hear your brief perspective. Thanks, Sandy. Thanks, Thanks Sandy. everybody. Yeah, it's, uh, it's obviously uh, an issue that's affected uh, primarily the supply chain. And I think this is the area that we have been focused on in terms of our our research and understanding where the where the uh, impacts have been from COVID. So this has been primarily where getting the connection between the consumer and the and the producer has has been a, an area that I think policy can be very informative in. I'll leave it as briefly as that. Okay. All right. Let me thank you very much. Let me just turn to Sloan's uh, to hear from the African perspective because you really just talked about the potential and, and the the, the early. Um, expansions that are beginning to take place. How do you see COVID and the economic disruption affecting that? Yeah, I think this is a very important question. And in fact, uh, we, we have um, seen a, a clear impact of this. Well, one of them is uh, through the supply chain, like uh, Gareth has mentioned. Uh, we've noticed like, for instance, in Southern Africa, we have uh, major hubs uh, where uh, fish feeds uh, are produced. Um, in our case, I think the Zambia, uh, the Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and, 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 and most of the fish farmers in the region are actually connected through these supply chains for inputs. Uh, where we saw transportation disrupted, uh, cross-border movements restricted, this had a, a huge impact on movement of inputs. And I think we see certainly that there's going to be a major impact on, on production. But also from, for the markets, I think access to markets have been uh, impacted upon um, as well as uh, farmers' access to extension workers and research support, uh, because um, most of the you know governments and NGOs have been on lockdown, and so they haven't been able to provide technical support to farmers. So I think these are some of the major um, major impacts. But of course, I mean from the business part of uh, part of uh, of, of the, the equation is that farmers have not been able really to sell their products. In some instances, we've heard farmers complaining that people have been saying, oh, we, we cannot um, buy the fish because we are afraid that, uh, you know, the link between the, you know, the COVID and the, um, um, you know, other aquatic diseases uh, might actually affect uh, uh, consumers. So these are some of the major issues that need to be worked upon with, with regard to COVID. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, uh, I have um, a question here for Patrick and, and other panelists can put their hand up if they want to expand on it. Um, but this is a question, I'm going to read it out because it's quite specific. So aquatic food has been and continues to be of immense importance to the population of Myanmar. How do we, the global community, uh, realistically deal with shocks 
the production systems, both capture and culture. That sort of extends from the previous question. We've looked at COVID, but obviously there are other potential kinds of shocks um, to both, to, to both um, uh, aspects of aquaculture. Patrick. Well, yes, a very real um, question, a very serious challenge. Um, sorry, I have a cat about to jump on my laptop. Um, the, uh, it, obviously, because I'm talking about fish. Um, there are many shocks, obviously economic shocks. There are natural disaster shocks, all, all of which um, require building resiliency and sustainability into whatever system, food system that we're, we're talking about. And for, for these, uh, to, to offer a buffer for a, for a smallholder pond-based aquaculture, um, there, there has to be built in uh, an understanding of where does the feed come from, what kind of feed can be derived in times of stress, right? It's got to be the right feed. Uh, many people have been saying, well, we've got to stop overfishing and using wild catch to feed pond fish. That's ab absolutely true. So there has to be more diversity of sources for inputs and more diversity of markets for the outputs. Uh, and that will allow for at least some buffer when certain segments of the value chain get closed off by different types of shocks. That requires both public sector and private sector to work together to promote investment, regula appropriate regulations, the market systems, and stimulate the demand that it, uh, would allow for more diversity on the production side, more diversity on the consumption side. Um, and where diversity is itself offering more uh, capacity for resilience. Okay, thanks, Patrick. And I've got a question here for Shakuntala, which is asking, how do we persuade governments to set policies uh, that favour aquatic foods to support uh, domestic nutritional security and not simply see aquatic foods as a source of export, sorry, a source of export income and GDP growth? It's an interesting question there. Thank you, Sandy. Well, that, this is something I've been discussing also with Patrick for many, many years. And it has to do about what values you put on foods and the value of foods for the term I use is nourishing nations. So you can put a value that's an economic, you can put a value that's an even economic value on the amount of money you would get from exporting the food, or you can put a value on your population and especially the poor and vulnerable increasing their consumption of nutritious foods with aquatic foods being one of that. And if you would do that and then put another value on the effect it has on growth and development, cognition, school performance, work performance, the intergenerational benefits you get from the well-nourished mother passing on to, the, to her well-nourished child and you put a value on that of that is on national development, then I do think that you can make a change in policy makers and the way they see the value for national development. So it's the kind of parameters you use that go beyond the monetary value and the long-term perspective of healthy and sustainable national development. Over to you, Sandy. Thanks so much. Uh, Sunila, do you want to follow up on that question? I um, mean, clearly you've um, described what seems to be a really integrated set of approaches um, uh, going on in, in, in your country. And I'm just wondering, in terms of this tension between um, uh, local livelihood needs and the need for GDP and export growth, how, do you, how does that play in very briefly in your country? You still with us, Sunila? Yes. So, did you manage to catch that? Uh, Sandy, could you uh, repeat your question? Yeah, sure, sure. So, it's let me just come back to it. Um, um, hold on, let me just pull it back. I've just had a whole lot more questions. So, um, hold on a second. Uh, okay, yeah. So, this was the one. Um, 
that uh, how do you persuade governments to set policies to really focus on the domestic um, nutritional security agenda and not simply to see aquatic foods as a source of export uh, income and GDP growth? Just very briefly, because clearly, um, you know, you've had some success in, in what you were describing in a, quite a rounded approach across different sectors. Uh, regarding the, the policy, I already told you that fishery policy is not uh, the, uh, developed in Nepal. This is drafted, but it is still in the process for the uh, approval by the ministry. However, I heard that there is the space for the small scale farmers uh, in that policy. So the fisheries, uh, the contribution in the national GDP, that means the, is the around the 1.13 and then, and we need to increase this, the uh, contribution of the fisheries in the national GDP. And for this, the government is, uh, uh, the folk, government focuses on the commercial aquaculture and the commercial spaces, like the farmers are now attracted towards the new species, uh, fast growing species like the pangas and the tilapia. And, uh, uh, but I think that uh, we need to uh, the, do the lot of advocacy and also do lobbying for this, uh, the development of this small scale aquaculture in Nepal. That is my Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for that contribution. So I have another um, question here, which I think is for Andrew. Uh, and Andrew, this is um, asking you to elaborate on the lower nutritional value of aquaculture fish and how this can be improved. And I think there, you know, I, I remember seeing this in the brief, this, um, this phenomenon where um, fish raised in aquaculture do sometimes have a different uh, profile and perhaps you could just expand a little bit on that and just um, just really thinking about how how one might address it what kind of things are being looked at Andrew over to you sure thank you Sandy this is a great question um, I think it's a really interesting topic you know like like us fish to some extent are what they eat and um, you know there's we, we did a review paper actually looking at, you know, how can you influence, what is known about how you can influence the nutritional profile of fish through their feeds. Um, and traditionally, the research is focused on trying to produce healthy fish and also, you know, to maximize productivity rather than the nutritional content of fish. And I think what's known in general is that the fatty acid profile of some species can be modified by including, you know, the fatty acids, omega-3 fatty acids, for example, in the feed, and you, you can modify that, and that's been well studied, but there's been less study of the micronutrients and, and how you can influence that. But I also think in addition to the need for more research on feeds, um, you know, what species you choose to promote in aquaculture is also a really important consideration. And so if you're trying to fill certain nutrient gaps, you know, you should think about, um, which species you're trying to promote. And in some countries like Bangladesh, polyculture is very common and growing multiple types of species can help to increase you know, the ability to fill nutrient gaps. Yeah, so is that something in terms of the, of the investment to drive those kind of changes forward? Do, where do you see that coming from? Do you see that as being a really important kind of build up of research um, in terms of the kind of measures that could be introduced in governments and NGOs helping to share better practice? Um, how do you see this working? Or do you see many parties being involved in it being quite a, you know, a, a, an incremental process? Yeah. I mean, I, I think in general, the technologies, like we haven't had the investment in technologies around aquaculture in the global south and in the species that are of greatest relevance in the global south that we have in species like salmon, you know, which are of greater interest to populations in the global north. And so I think there needs to be more inv investment in the in these technologies. And there's tremendous potential here, you know, unlike um, grain crops, you know, where you're lucky to get, you know, a small incremental growth in productivity, 
you know, what we've seen with tilapia, for example, and some of the research that Worldfish has done is every generation you can increase productivity by 10%. I mean, that's a huge potential. Yeah. So uh, I think if some of that effort was also devoted to trying to explore the nutritional pro profile of fish, I think that, that would be a very interesting way to link this with human nutrition. Yeah, and, and that, point, that, that point does come across in the brief, actually, the incredible um, gains in, in, in growth rates that you can get over a relatively small number of generations. Um, yeah, really impressive. Okay, well, um, I think we, I'm going to draw this session to a close now and uh, wind up the meeting. Um, I think we've heard from all our speakers today that you know, the argument for better use of aquatic food systems as a whole, whether we're talking about sustainable aquaculture, fisheries, in a food system, um, food system transformation um, to give us more sustainable and more resilient diets is absolutely compelling. I think the case has really been made today and it's been great to hear too about the world fish, recent world fish strategy um, that's going to help uh, move this along um, um, as we progress with the summit and other, other important meetings uh, this year. So I think we can see that there's, there's quite a momentum building potentially to um, to really gear up the importance of aquaculture and fisheries so that it's better recognised and better acted upon by the, the global food systems community. So I think all of our speakers today have really highlighted uh, the importance of the agricultural research agenda as well. And we've seen quite a lot of um, specific references to uh, policies and investments and the approaches that can be taken forward. So I think what we can conclude certainly is that mobilising global interest um, in, in, in a hot, particularly in lower middle income countries, um, but also all kinds of partnerships is really key. And there's a lot of momentum around the world to, to make this happen. So I think the timing of what we've been discussing today is, is really, really very encouraging. So I want to encourage uh, the people who are with us, and I'm very pleased that um, we've had uh, quite close to 200 people with us for, for nearly the whole time. Um, so um, do get in touch with uh, the global panel uh, and uh, researchers at World Fish uh, to discuss ways in which um, we can work together and help move this uh, important agenda uh, forward. Um, and I think uh, colleagues at World Fish are particularly interested in opportunities to collaborate, um, particularly in terms of food and water policies and investments and opportunity for scaling these ideas. That's, that's going to be really key. So just to remember um, that you can access the brief uh, on the Global Panel's website. Uh, I think it's also in the, the, the link is also in the chat room. Um, and uh, World Fish's uh, um, 2030 uh, research and innovation strategy is also on the link in the chat box. So really, I hope that these will prove uh, useful. So um, it just uh, leaves me to say final thanks to everyone. Sir John has sent his apologies. He was so sorry that his, um, his IT uh, did not... Um, stand up to, to, to joining us today. That's, that's been very unusual. Um, but uh, he's very grateful to uh, Ivan Kent for standing in for him. And I know he was really looking forward to meet, meeting uh, Gareth Johnston, but we'll have to leave that um, for another time. But I'm so glad that everybody else could make it. So thanks so much to our two speakers, um, Andrew and uh, Patrick Webb, uh, and also to our three panelists. It's great. Um, and this is one plus of Zoom, I think that we can reach uh, people from different countries and bring in specialists from Nepal, Bangladesh, uh, and Africa um, to be able to share those perspectives. I think that is, that is worth so much. So I hope the discussions today have given you some insights um, that will help you take forward uh, the challenges in your own networks um, to try and affect collective action for positive, positive change uh, in this field. Um, so the Aquatic foods can, can help us as we seek to further food system transformation. So uh, a big thank you to everyone. Thank you to our participants for staying with us for so long. We'd love to hear from you. Um, do keep in touch. And I'm now going to close the event. Thank you all very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. All the best. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.